to start a new series this morning, and, and uh, I've called it Messiah Rewind. And basically, this time of year, at, first of all, look at all these decorations. Didn't these ladies do a great job this week? They came out and spent multiple hours out here. Uh, I didn't get to see my wife hardly at all this week. She was out here fighting with Christmas lights. They would put them on the trees, and they'd plug them in, and they'd burn out. And so they'd have to re, uh, redo the whole thing again, and, uh, but it turned out really nice, and I appreciate it all of their work. But this time of the year, it's real easy to say, hey, you know what? Let's just look at this Christmas story. Let's look at this baby Jesus and let's maybe take some of the aspects. And I've done series in the past where we've looked at the different people who came to see the baby Jesus. But this year, as I was preparing for this month, I really felt like we needed to take this story and I wanted us to not just look at baby Jesus, but I wanted us to look at Jesus. And see, it's good to, it's good to understand that Jesus came as a baby, but ultimately, why did he come? as a baby. And so we're going to, over the next few weeks, we're going to rewind backwards through the story of Christ as to why he was here and what he did for us because he was here. But before we do that, I want to, I want, I was reading in my devotions a few weeks ago and this, this particular paragraph was in there. And so I jotted it down and I want to share this with you because I think it's a good way for us to be reminded of who Jesus is. It said this, Jesus was the God man. He was just as much man as if he had never been God, and just as much God as if he had never been man. His humanity did not diminish his deity, and his deity did not overpower his humanity. By his own choice, he lived a sinless life, wholly obeying the Father. So this morning, you may say, well, if we're going to rewind the life of Christ, you're probably going to start at the resurrection, or maybe you'll start at the crucifixion. But I actually want to go even further into this story, into the book of Acts, where we hear Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven, and they were this, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. God, in the next few moments as we look at your word, I pray, Father, that you will reveal yourself to us. God, we are so thankful, and we're reminded again as we step into this particular season of this amazing gift that you have given to us. But Father God, I pray that today you will remind us again of just even one of those reasons as to why you sent your son. So Father, I pray that you'll open our ears to hear that, Father God, we will leave this place different than we were when we came in, and God, that we would be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we look at this verse, it's a verse that probably most of us are familiar with. It's a verse that a lot of times you'll have a church will use this particular passage of Scripture as their missions verse. It's, the, it's that mission statement that we're to go and we're to be witnesses throughout the whole world. And of course, that's true. But I want us to break it down even a little bit further than that. We're going to speak of this power that Jesus talks about, and we're going to actually do a series coming up where we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so I'm not going to delve too deep into that this morning with you, but I do want you to understand that we are a church that believes strongly in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we believe that that's a power that's accessible to all of us, and that we need to be utilizing the power that God has given us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was preparing them for what life was going to look like after he left. And as I was thinking about this particular passage of Scripture, I was thinking about the fact that Jesus says in this verse, he says, I'm going to give you this power so that you can go and what? Be witnesses. And then he lists where? Well, the first one that he lists is Jerusalem. And I want you to understand, a lot of times I've always taken that verse to mean Jerusalem, that means right where we live. So we need to be witnesses where we live. But the more I look at this, the more I realize what Jesus was really saying here is not only that, but he's also saying this. If you were familiar at all with Jerusalem during the time that Jesus walked the earth, Jerusalem was a very uh, very well-versed and very religious society. It was very well uh, known that the, the scriptures that's in fact as a child that's what you were raised to know was the scriptures that was what they studied in school so it was a place where they pretty much felt like they probably had it all together so as I was thinking about this particular passage of scripture when Jesus says listen I'm going to give you this power and you're going to go and be my witnesses and he lists Jerusalem there were probably many people who were taken back by that why would we be witnesses to Jerusalem they already we already know it We already know it all. We've got it together. If you're going to go be witnesses, you should go be witnesses somewhere else because here in Jerusalem, we know our stuff. But Jesus is saying, listen, you may think you know your stuff, but you don't. 
You may think you know what God wants for your life, but maybe you don't. And I think that oftentimes the people who need Jesus the most are the ones who think they don't. It was about a year ago that our men's group was reading a book called Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. And uh, if you've never read the book, I'd encourage you to read it. it. It's one of those books that will definitely challenge you. The premise of the book is this, that there's a lot of people who sit in church today that would call themselves, that would consider themselves to be followers of Christ. But the reality is, if you were to break it down and really look at the way that we live our lives, oftentimes we're not so much followers of Christ as we are fans of Christ. We like Jesus. Jesus is a good guy. I'm, I'm excited to celebrate Jesus' birthday, and I'm really excited because I like Jesus. Jesus is good, right? There's not too many people who would disagree with that statement. But yet, as believers, as people who are c- consider themselves to be followers of Jesus, how many of you know that should impact us? It should change us. It should change the way that we live our lives. It should sh- change the way that we go about our day as followers of Christ. So I actually went back to that book this week because as I was preparing this, I thought, you know, there were some really key statements that he made in this book. And so I'm going to share a couple of those with you this morning. The first one is this. Fans have a tendency to confuse their knowledge for intimacy. They don't recognize the difference between knowing about Jesus and truly knowing Jesus. And I think that's true of a lot of people that would find themselves sitting in a church maybe on this Sunday morning, that would say, you know, I know a lot about Jesus. In fact, I maybe have some Bible school experience, or maybe I have been raised in the church, and my Sunday school teacher did a good job at drilling those Bible verses into me. And so I know a lot, but can I tell you, God doesn't care about your knowledge as much as he cares about your heart. He wants you to be a follower not just a fan. You see, fans, we can know all the statistics. We can look at our favorite football team and we can know the statistics. (laughs) No matter how sad they may be. Oh, come on now. Uh, They, uh, but... To be, to be a follower of Christ is to not just know about him, but it's to know him. It's to have an intimate relationship with him. Another passage that I thought was interesting as I re-glanced through the book was this. Your faith has always been more about honoring your heritage than surrendering your heart. And I think there's a lot of believers today who would find themselves sitting in a church and that's really what's more important to them. It's their traditions and, their, and, the, and the things that they grew up knowing and that's what's, what's most important to them, more so even than surrendering your heart. In fact, this next passage, I was going to just try and give you a synopsis, but I thought, you know what, I'm not even going to try. I'm going to read it to you and I actually put it up on the screen because I want you to hear this. This was a, a statement that was made in the book that I that convicts even me. It says this, woe to you fans. If you would be as passionate about feeding the poor as you are your church's style of worship, then hunger would end this week. Woe to you fans. If you sacrificed as much to care for the homeless and the hungry in your community as you do for your church buildings and places of worship, the need would be wiped out. Woe to you fans. If you would be zealous about caring for the sick as you are about Christmas tree being called a holiday tree, health insurance would not be a problem. Can I tell you, our community is looking for people to love it. You know, I get, I get sucked into some of this as well. It's real easy to, to go, and I, I, I was walking into a place of business last Christmas time, and there was somebody standing outside with a petition, and they wanted, they wanted the store owner to know that it shouldn't be called an Xmas tree, that it should be called a Christmas tree. And you know, you go, oh, yeah, we want to keep Christ in Christmas, right? And that's, that sounds like a good fight. But can I tell you, it's not worth fighting that fight compared to going and loving our community. Because guess what happens? If we go out and we say, we put all our energy into saying, hey, I don't want it to be called a holiday. I want it to be called Christmas. So I'm going to put all my energy and my effort into that. Guess what? All we do is we may get a store owner to change their mind if you get enough people to sign the bottom line. But guess what? If instead of that, we would go out and love our community, we would go out and show compassion to those who are hurting, all of a sudden now they realize that this Jesus isn't just somebody that is is far off, but he's somebody who actually loves loves them and cares for them. And guess what? They're going to want to celebrate his birthday, aren't they? 
We've got to change people's hearts, not just with, not with a petition, but with the way that we show love to our community and the way that we love each other. 2 Timothy 3.5 says it like this, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So I want us to look at the story of Christ, and this is what Jesus had said right before he left this place. So it was obviously an important statement that he said, listen, I'm going to give you power, and I want you to take this power, and I want you to go and be my witnesses. How do we be a witness? To be a witness is to show others what Christ has done in our lives, right? That's how you witness something. Witnessing isn't a petition. Witnessing isn't a flyer or a track. It's, it's going and, and loving somebody and showing them, hey, God has changed me. He's done something great in my life. And, and, and that's where the witnessing part comes from. But I want us to rewind this, story, or rewind this story a little bit back to the fact that Jesus has now been raised from the tomb and the women go and they show up to go and, and to deal with the body. And they get there and they find the tomb empty. And the statement that is made there by one of the angels that is standing there says, why do you look for the living among the dead? Can I tell you that we live in a society right now where there's a lot of people looking for life and they're finding death. They're looking for the living and it's among the dead. I had somebody last weekend on uh, Sunday morning come to me and she's fairly new to her faith and she's excited about what God's doing in her life. And she pulled me aside and she said, you know, Jason, I got invited last night to go with some of my old friends and we went to this concert. And I went into this concert and it was a concert that I would not have ever thought twice about going to before. But I, I went in and I was sitting in this concert and she said, all of a sudden, the lyrics of the songs, I was realizing how, how much they made me feel uneasy in my spirit. And she said, so all of a sudden I began to pray. And as I began to pray, she said, I looked around and she said, I saw people. And it was just as if there was just death in the room, as if people were, were looking for something and finding nothing. And she said, I didn't know what to do with it. She said, I didn't know if I should go and pray for them, if I should go and share Jesus with them. I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I was one of those people not that long ago, that I was looking for life in all of the wrong places. And now I know where life is. I know where l- true life can be found. And I thought to myself, how many people do we know that are looking for life and they've gone to a place where there is no life, where there's just death? Sometimes, unfortunately, the church can be a place that people go to find life and they don't find it. Instead, they find infighting. They find people arguing with each other, questioning, being upset. The music isn't the right style. The preaching isn't right. The... The, it's too loud, it's too quiet, whatever, and we're fighting instead of, instead of using this power that God's given us to go and to change the world. The church needs to rise up and use the power that Jesus talks about to transform this world. Matthew seven twenty two and 23 says this, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? and in your name perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, I believe that many believers are very close, but yet so far away. I mean, look at this particular passage of scripture. These are people who not not just were going to church on Saturdays or Sundays or whatever. These are people who were actually seeing miracles take place. They're watching demons uh, driven out. They're seeing people healed. And yet still, Jesus said, you know what? Get away from me. You never knew me. So how many of us, how many people do we know that that would consider themselves to be believers are really just fans of Jesus? And on that day when we stand before him, he's going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. You see, I don't want to be caught in that category. I want to make sure that when I stand before my Savior, I want to hear those words that I so long to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And that doesn't come from us fighting about how the Christmas decorations should be done or, or, or whether we should have a Wednesday night class or a Thursday night class. It comes from us going out and showing Christ's love to our community and teaching people that God is real and that there is life to be found. You may sit in this room and you may know all the stories and you can quote all the scripture. You can say the right things and you can act the right way, but you are living powerless. You see, your faith has been informational and not transformational. 
If your faith is not changing you, if it's not transforming your life, if it's not transforming those around you, then you are living an informational life. And it feels good to know all the answers. It feels good to go into a Bible study and be able to answer anybody's question and to feel like you're just a walking biblical encyclopedia. But I want to tell you, if that's where it ends, then you're not doing it right. You might have thought we skimped on the decorations when you saw this sitting out here today, but I asked Bob last night to get me some Christmas lights. And How many of you have one of these at your house, huh? That's beautiful. Um, I think he got this from my house, actually. This is, this is how we do it at the end of the season. But I, I had him bring this out because I wanted to give one of our high-tech illustrated sermons once again. Um, as you look at this, obviously these lights were designed for a reason, not to be in a big wad, but they were designed to be hung out and, and, and be able to light a room and to make a beautiful decoration. But can I tell you that it comes with this little plug at the end, and there's a power uh, thing here. On, oh, I'm going to mess up their decoration. Uh, there's, there's a power source up here. But can I tell you that having this plug sit here does nothing, right? I mean, we're all, uh, this isn't science class, okay? You all understand that that has to be plugged in, okay? And so when we plug it in, it does what it's supposed to do. And hey, they actually light up, so that's a good sign. How many of you have had that Christmas uh, no matter how many you buy, it seems like you've got to buy more every year, isn't it? It's a conspiracy, I think. But, um, but I think a lot of us live our faith like this. We get close to the power source, and we like to just feel like, well, that's close enough. But can I tell you, until that thing plugs in, it will never do what it was intended to do. It will never do what, it, what the designer designed it to do. And you can be this close to the power source or we can put it on the other side of the room from the power source and it's still gonna not do anything until we plug it in to the power. And I think that a lot of us in our faith, that's the way that we live our lives is we live just outside of plugging ourselves in to this power source that is our God. And we walk around and we just feel like, hey, it's good enough. I, you know, I go on Saturday night or I go on Sunday morning to church. And hey, it was even below zero and I still came to church. I'm not like one of those people who are just watching on the live stream right now because I didn't want to get out of bed. No offense to you live streamers. A little bit of offense to you live streamers. But... I want you to understand that God has called us and has so much more for us. It will be frustrating if we live our existence just close to the power source, but never plugging in. We will never feel like we've accomplished or we've been what we've been designed to be. Now, I told you that in a, in a month or so, we're going to do a series and we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And for some of you, that freaks you out. Some of you, that excites you. But can I tell you, this is really what it's all about. It's about understanding that God has more for you. It doesn't matter where you are in your walk. God has more for you. It doesn't matter if you've, if you've been a believer your whole life and you're walking this journey out. No matter where we are, there's more for us. And some of you may feel like, oh, well, I'll wait. When I hear this series, then I'll, I'll, I'll you know, have a time of prayer and I'll, and I'll see about this whole baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, you don't have to wait for a series. My grandpa... This is just a side note, but my grandpa on my dad's side, I never got to meet him. He died when my, when my dad was quite young. But my dad shared with me this story again, and, and uh, so I wanted to reiterate it to you guys. When my, when my grandpa was uh, alive, he was a farmer. He was out in uh, Canada and kind of lived way out with all of, his, all of his kids and his wife. And a guy came to the door one day, and he was a, kind of a missionary or an evangelist, and he came, and he shared Christ with my grandpa. And my grandpa accepted the Lord, and this was a Lutheran missionary that had come, and so he accepted the Lord, and, and from that day on, he considered himself to be a good Lutheran. And uh, so one day, he was studying his Bible, and he went out to go and plow the field. And when he went out to the field, he was plowing it, and he was praying. And he prayed, and he said, God, you, I know you have more for me than this. So he said, will you just show yourself to me? Show yourself to me in a real way. And all of a sudden, 
he felt something and he stopped plowing and he got down on his knees in the middle of that field and he began to cry and to pray. And as he did that, all of a sudden he found himself speaking in a language that he didn't understand. And in that moment, he didn't know what was going on. He just knew that that's what had hit him. So he began to pray and he kept praying that way. Well, a few months later, another missionary came to his door and this missionary came and said, are you a believer? He said, yes, I'm a Lutheran. And he said, oh, okay, you're a Lutheran. That's good. He said, well, let's study the Bible together. So they sat down and they studied the Bible. And as they prayed, all of a sudden, my grandpa began to pray in this other language. And this this missionary said, oh, you must be Pentecostal. He said, no, I'm Lutheran. And he said, he said, well, you're speaking in tongues. And he said, oh, is that what that is? I didn't know. I just prayed and asked God for more. And that's what he gave me. I tell you that story this morning because I want you to understand it's not about you achieving some, some goal, something that you can put on your, some patch you can wear on your shirt. It's about us all coming to a place in our relationship with God where we say, God, I want more. Whatever you have for me, God, I want it. Whatever you're willing to give me, I'll take it. Whatever you think I'm ready for, hand it to me, God, because I want to be closer to you than I've ever been. And wherever that leads you, guess what? It's going to be a great place. In the Old Testament, it continually says God with us. And when Jesus walked the earth, that was definitely what they were talking about was God with us. But can I tell you, after Jesus ascended into heaven, things changed and it began to refer to God in us. You see, Jesus says, it's better for me to go. Why? Because while God is here, that's good. But God in us is ideal. You see, Jesus walking the earth, what an amazing thing that would be to be alive at that time and to be able to go to, to uh, hear him preach and to see the miracles take place. And that's amazing and that's great, but it's still, he was, he was one man that was here on earth and he could only go so far. But when he ascended to heaven and he said, listen, I'm going to go, but I'm going to send somebody so that what? We can have access to this same power. But some of us live our lives as if the power is so far off, but the reality is it's accessible to us. We just need to want it, and we need to ask for it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 again. Let's read it again because I want to I point out another part of this, and then I'm going to let you go. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to Judea, and to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, we're not going to deal with the second one there, but I do want to look at Samaria, because I want you to understand what Jesus is saying here. We know that Jerusalem also meant those who were religious, those who thought they had it all together, and maybe that's you in the room, maybe you've been raised in the church, and you think you know it all, and I want to tell you, you still need to to, uh, reach out to God, and understand that God can do something new in your life, no matter how long you've known him. But this second part, or this third part in here, as he talks about Samaria, I want us to look at that for a moment because up until Jesus, there was a, pow- there was a powerful religious elite and they lorded their power over others using their knowledge and their privilege as a power. But when Jesus mentions Samaria in the same sentence, in the same capacity as Jerusalem, he no doubt shocked the people of that day. Because as we look at Samaritans uh, throughout the New Testament, whenever they're mentioned, they're mentioned as a lower form. They're mentioned as a lower class people. And so now all of a sudden Jesus says, listen, I'm going to go, I'm going to send power, you're going to be witnesses to Jerusalem. What? Why does Jerusalem need witnesses? Because you do. And and then it's also going to be to Samaria. So now all of a sudden they're in the same category in Jesus' mind. So the power structure has now been broken. Can I tell you that if the power comes from the Holy Spirit, he is mobile. He goes where you go. No place or person holds exclusive rights to God's power. This building is just that. It's a building. It is not the church. You are the church. So the Holy Spirit doesn't live in this building. He lives in us. Jesus does not live in this building. He lives inside of you. So when you go from this place, he goes with you. And that transformational power that we're speaking of flows with you. I like this building. I like that we have a building. I think that's great. I don't like it so much when the pipes freeze like yesterday, but I do like having a building. 
But in the, in the grand scheme of things, if we came out here tomorrow and this building was not here, the church still lives on. The power comes at a cost. It's a good thing that the gospel has nothing to do with how worthy we are, but how high of a price Jesus was willing to pay. We had some people that were building a house next to us uh, a couple of years back and uh, came home uh, and Shannon had been there and somebody had knocked on the door while I was gone and, and he said, hey, we're building the house behind you. Can we plug in for power? And uh, Shannon was like, I didn't know what to say. So I said, yes. I said, okay, well, that's fine. How long? He didn't say. So a couple of days and a week go by and they're sawing, they're doing all kinds of stuff and they're plugged into my power on the side of my house. I'm like, Okay, so now do I have to be that guy that I got to go over and be the jerk and tell him, hey, you know, that's costing me money when you're doing that. And so I let it go a little longer, trying to be the good neighbor. And he kept going and kept going. They, I mean, they got, they got all kinds of saws going on over there. They got extra power cords coming from my house. And I was like, all right. So I walked over and met the gentleman. And I said, hey, just so you know, that I, I don't mind helping, but that's costing me money over there. And we have this good conversation. But what if in that moment I had said, hey, you know what? I think this is awesome what you're doing. You, you just plug in. In fact, you guys don't ever even have to get a meter over there. We'll just run a bunch of extension cords and we'll just let you, you know, we'll just make it work. That's great. I got it. I'll take care of your power for you. you all you have to do is just plug in, right? A lot of people would go, that is awesome. Can I get cable from you too? That would be sweet. <laughs> But the fact is, is when Jesus left, he said, listen, I'm going to provide power. I've already paid the cost for it. So all you have to do is plug in. We'd be crazy not to plug in, wouldn't we? Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, Christ has paid the price for your sins, but he's also given you access to the power. But why did he do that? So that we can share. If you want God's blessing in your life, on your family, on your finances, on your health, on your relationships, then you need to get with God's agenda. You see, he's building a kingdom, a church, a spiritual family for all of eternity. He wants his lost children to be found. And that's where you come in. The more you make God's agenda your own, the more God is going to bless your life. You see, this Christmas season, you can examine where you might find yourself. Maybe you find yourself somebody who's lived in Jerusalem. You've been raised in the church and you know all that you need to know. Maybe you're like me and you did Bible quiz when you were younger. And so you can still quote scripture inside and out. You know the right things to say and do. But you're like a lamp that's near the outlet and not plugged in. But I want to tell you this morning, the power is available to you today. Maybe you find yourself on the other end of the spectrum and you would say, I feel like I'm from Samaria. I feel like there's no way that that same stuff can be accessible to me. There's no way with my past, with all the things that I've done, there's no way that God has those good things for me. You see, I can only imagine how a Samaritan must have felt on that day when they hear that Jesus says, listen, I'm going to put you in the same category as Jerusalem today because I love all of my people equally. And so you may sit in this room and the enemy has been lying to you for far too long, telling you you're not good enough. There's no way you could ever be used by God. There's no way that he's got anything good for you. You can come and sit in church, but that's as far as it's going to go for you. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell because God loves you today. He died. He sent his son to die on a cross so that you can have that grace and that forgiveness of sin that's accessible to you this morning. You see, when Jesus did that, when he made that statement, he included you and no one can take his inclusion away. Nothing you've done can take that inclusion away. All you need to do is accept it and plug in. And if you'll do that, it will change your life. It will change your life. Would you close your eyes with me? We're going to close this time. 
As we do, I, I want to take a moment right now because I believe that there are some of you that sit in this room today and maybe even as you sit here, you've come to church for a while. Maybe you've grown up in church your whole life and you hear that message about Jerusalem. And maybe you sit in this room today and you need to be honest with yourself and say, you know, Jason, I hear you talk about that and I really have... My faith has been informational. It hasn't transformed me. It hasn't changed anything in me. But I'm ready to make that step. I'm ready to move in that direction. Or maybe you find yourself on the other end of the spectrum and you would consider yourself to be from Samaria and you you feel like, man, I'm just not worthy. Whatever end of that spectrum you're on, can I tell you this morning, you can take one step towards Jesus and your life can change. I know even as I say that, there are some that sit in this room that you've been in the church for long enough that to, the thought of raising your hand right now is embarrassing to you. Well, I don't want anybody to know that I don't have it all together. First of all, no one else is looking around besides me. But second of all, are you going to continue to live that informational faith or are you going to allow God to transform you?